Well, uh, good afternoon. Um, so this is your professor recording a, another video. Let's see. I'm going to see if I can get this angle a little bit better here so that I can avoid the glare of the window. Yeah, maybe just a little more this way. Oh, okay. Perfect. All right. So anyway, uh, so we're going to cover... Uh, Units, uh, well, we're going to cover the last information on hardware description languages. And so that's going to be, um, I guess it's chapters 17 and 20. But uh, I'm not going to ask you very much about this. Really, what I'll pretty much do uh, on the final exam, I'll, I'll give you a uh, sequential design block in uh, VHDL or maybe Verilog, I don't know. But I'll, I'll cover both of those today. And I want you to be able just to to, to realize that it's a flip flop and 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 uh, something about the flip flop, like what kind of flip flop it is, whether it has um, a set or a clear, whether it's a rising or falling edge, things like that. And I'll show you how to do that in both VHDL, VHDL and Verilog. Okay, so you remember. Um, so I guess before we do this, let me just uh, briefly touch on the syllabus. So um, here we are on the 27th of May, uh, sorry, April, and uh, this is what we're going to cover. That's what's scheduled, and homework 11 should be due tonight, although I did change the date, so I believe you can turn it in uh, on the 4th. And the very last homework, uh, sorry, we have homework 12 due on the 1st and 13 due on the 4th, but all three of those will be due on the 4th. Uh, so um, you should try and you know, get homework 11 done today and turned in by tomorrow, today or tomorrow. And then you should try and get 12 definitely turned in on the first so you can do 13. But I will tell you the last couple are really just um, uh, copying the uh, the design problems uh, that are completely worked out in the text. So if you have the text and you go through the text, that shouldn't be a problem. Those are all worked out for you. But I just want you to sort of copy them down so you look through them and thought through them yourself. All right, and then um, we definitely have some things to learn. And the big thing we need to learn before the test, we're going to, this little bit on VHDL today, we'll do that. And then we also need to learn uh, how to do a sequential design. And we've done a couple of them, but we haven't done enough. Hopefully I'll have time today to go through one. We'll see. All right, let's get to it. So uh, the, so hardware description languages basically, uh, we're going to talk about HDLs as used for sequential design today. And uh, we're, we'll cover VHDL. And in VHDL, we use what's called a process block when we do a sequential design. Now, the difference between combinational design and sequential design is exactly that. In a combinational design, as we've said many times before, you have, you have some network, you have some inputs and outputs from the network, and the current set of inputs immediately determines after small propagation delay time, the outputs. That's combinational design. And that's what we did in the middle part of the course. Sequential design, on the other hand, depends upon, typically as a clock, and, and also has some memory as part of the circuit. So you have some inputs, you have a network, you have some outputs, you also have a clock. And inside the network, you have some memory elements, almost always flip-flops. And the current inputs don't in and of themselves and by themselves determine the outputs, but also some memory, which basically is usually, we usually refer to that what's remembered as a state. So we're in some state, plus we have inputs, and that tells us what our outputs are. <coughs> now, in a more, all we need to know is the state, that determines the outputs. But in a melee, we need the state and the next inputs to determine the output. All right. So the same is true in sequential design, where, where most of our, our concurrent statements just execute whenever the right side changes, regardless of where, how they're encountered or where they are in the program. Um, but in sequential design, our statements only execute typically on either an asynchronous input change or the clock edge. So these blocks, the process block and the always block in Verilog, these have clocks. And, uh, and that's what makes them sequential design components. Now, 
uh, I'm not going to spend much time on this, but I do want you to know that in Verilog, it allows you to use an always block in a what is essentially a bastardized way to generate combinational logic. So even though you write it like there's a clock and it's going to depend on uh, and it's and it's only going to execute when when certain things change, when the synthesizer looks at it, it knows that the that that the engineer really intended for it to be uh, not a sequential design, but a combinational design. And so it really just ignores the fact it's in an always block and, and synthesizes it as a combinational design. Most of the time when you use always blocks in Verilog, you intend them to actually be combinational design, I mean, sorry, sequential design and based on a clock. But, but it, it does have this ability to be used in, a, in this bastardized way to, also, to do not only sequential logic, which is what it's really intended for, but you can also use it to do combinational logic. That is not true in VHDL. In VHDL, the process block is always for sequential design. It is never used for combinational design. Now, obviously, within these blocks, there are, there are uh, what we would normally consider a combinational design type statements. Um, but they're only executed when the conditions are met uh, that that control the process block and we call those conditions the sensitivity list and we'll see this in a minute we're also going to talk about signals and constants arrays operators uh, and a few other things all right so we've seen this before remember we, we want we, we talk about levels of description and one of the real advantages of a hardware description language for making hard for making hardware is that we can describe things at a high level and avoid getting down into the weeds the details that would literally choke us to death if we tried to design a chip with a billion transistors and we had to deal with a schematic that had the uh, the symbol for every single one of those billion transistors all connected in various ways. No one can make sense out of something that complicated. And so, so we leave those details to the synthesizer and we're allowed to describe things in these English language statements at fairly high levels. The highest level is just a behavior level. So something like this. S is assigned the result of A plus B. Now notice we have, you know, somewhere we've defined A and B and S, but but in this statement we we we, we just see. So they could be they could be one bit each. They could be many many bits. But but we haven't described at all uh, the the circuit, uh, the gates that will be make up the circuit. Whether we're going to do a ripple carry adder or a carry propagate or carry look ahead, any one of the many types of adders. We're, We've just specified A plus B equals S, essentially. So that's a very high, high level description. And then when we start actually putting in the gates and drawing the circuit, now we're down into the structure level. Between there, there's where we kind of specify how the data is going to flow, how many bits, and how they're going to, how that's going to work. But when we actually get down to the components, now we're at the structural. So we talk about behavioral, data flow, and structural. Then once we push the button and let the synthesizer do its thing, now we either get all the photo mask and the steps to use in the foundry to make the part uh, from scratch from a silicon wafer, or we get a bit file to load into a programmable logic device that will turn that device into the hardware we have described. <clears throat> so those are the two ways that we physically implement our design. Okay, And remember these three levels. Okay. So, uh, so going back to just uh, combinational logic, in VHDL, we 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 have uh, our functional modules are always built up by two parts. One is called the entity, in this case, entity of silly function, and in that entity we have a port list, all the signals that come in, all the signals that go out from and to the outside world or to other modules. And then there may very well be lots of internal signals and that sort of thing. They're defined in, an, in a separate declaration, which is the architecture. And the architecture references the entity and describes how the, signal, how, the, how the signals described in the port list are actually utilized. And like I said, there may be internal signals described in the, in the architecture that are never seen to the outside world, so they don't appear in the entity but you can have quite a few additional signals. In this case, I guess we don't. Um, here, I'll move my thing. But, um, but anyway, in the case of Verilog, it's very similar. The only difference is 
we don't use keywords like not and 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 are. Uh, we use we use the the C uh, operators. We use ampersand for bitwise and, uh, and we use vertical bar for or, and we use uh, tilde for bitwise not. Uh, we also have uh, logical ands, ors, and inversion, uh, exclamation point for inversion, two ampersands for logical and, two vertical lines for logical r. All right, so this is basically the same thing. Not a, and it with not b, and it with not c, or a, and it with not b, and it with not c, or a, and it with not b, and it with c. And they're the same but they're just different syntactic ways of doing this. All right, notice here in the module definition, we have the port list within the, within the entire module definition. So here's the port list and here's how the signals are gonna be used. And then you have end, end modules. So in Verilog, our, our modules are all, all contained in one thing. Whereas in VHDL, we have separate, <coughs> we have a separate entity uh, declaration and a separate architectural def de de uh, definition that uh, that references the the entity. So we so here you don't repeat the port list, and you can actually have several different architectures using the same entity declaration. Um, all right, so that's back to the original combinational logic. This is just combinational. When the inputs when when the signals on the right change, the output is re re recalculated. So if A changes, or B, or C, then this expression is recomputed and uh, uh, the updated value is assigned to Y. It might not change, but if there is a change, it would be assigned to Y. Same thing over here. All right. Now, uh, the, uh, here you have uh, the basic statement in VHDL. Signal tame, you have this funny uh, less than equal sign then you have an expression, then you have a, a built-in time delay with the keyword after, and uh, that's VHDL. If you do the same thing in Verilog, uh, you have a sign signal name pound delay, which is the same as this delay specification here, and then you have your expression. These are, anytime anything on the right side changes, these execute. Doesn't matter where they show up, they can be anywhere in the program. And the order they appear in makes no difference whatsoever. Whenever the right side changes, the left side is updated. And uh, this happens if there's 10 of these and they all had uh, a variable in them change at the same time, all 10 would be updated simultaneously. Now, not really, it's, it's, it's simulated that way, but, uh, but that's, how, that's how you should think about it. All right, now uh, notice we have a little different signal assignment operator here versus here. And we have, uh, in our expression, we use words like and, or, and not, Whereas here we we have the the C operators. All right. Okay. Now, um, so here we have uh, uh, these assignment statements in Verilog. Notice we have the bitwise and, the bitwise r, and the bitwise exclusive or, or are the well, yeah, exclusive ors have to be bitwise. And then here we have uh, delays. So ten nanoseconds are the delays and um, these are all all fine and we have this keyword assigned you can actually leave the assigned keyword off um, interestingly though we we do have a thing called propagation delay that's different from inertial delay uh, uh, sorry uh, transport delay which is different from inertial or propagation delay and we put these on the other side of the equal sign but you don't have to worry about that just throw that out for now Okay, so here's the VHDA module. I, I think I'm going to skip past this. Same thing we just said. You have the you have the entity declaration and then the architecture. All right. Uh, so here's a very log module. You have module uh, a, a one bit adder input ABC uh, in and output sum and C out. Uh, then your the actual uh, the actual uh, architecture of it is right here. Sum equals a uh, exclusive or with b exclusive or with carry in, and then you have this expression for carry out, and that's the end of the module. Uh, these are logical operators, 
but you could use bitwise operators because these are single these are single bits are called scalars not multi-bit vectors in any event uh, here's the same thing in Verilog I'm sorry the same thing in VHDL right here there's the entity uh, yeah, so in Verilog we have the, the port list there, and then uh, and then you would have the uh, then you would have obviously the architecture of the module in VHDL. Okay, so in VHDL it's not case sensitive. The statements end with semicolons just like they do in Verilog. Comments start with a dash. They do double slashes in uh, Verilog. Keywords are reserved, uh, and then uh, names and variables. They can be letters, numbers, and underscore can't end with an underscore, have to start with a letter. Uh, whereas in Verilog, names, uh, in general, it's all case sensitive. Uh, statements do end with a semicolon, comments start with double slash, keywords are reserved, just like in VHDL, and the names of variables, letters, numbers, underscore, and dollar sign. So we add the dollar sign. They must start with a letter or they can start with an underscore. And they can be up to 1024 characters, whereas in uh, in VHDL, there's, uh, I don't think there's a limit to how big they can be. Uh, and here's some of the other things. Have to start with a letter. Can't end with an underscore. No two underscores can be together. Has to be all in the same line of code, but it doesn't have to be. But it's not limited. But I don't know how you get it on the same line of code more than, you know, even a thousand characters on the same line. All right. Um, so in VHDL, we have... We have integers, bits, and vectors, and in Verilog we have uh, we have integer, bit, vectors, and registers. The only difference is that our vectors uh, have uh, have this uh, our, our our bits bits and vectors can basically have nine different types of uh, uh, in in VHDL and only four types in Verilog. Now in VHDL we really only use the first five types. And we'll cover those here right now. So here are the nine types. I don't even know what these last ones really are, but but basically the ones you have are uh, you deal with zero and one, obviously, and then you have uninitialized and unknown, and high Z are disconnected. Whereas in uh, and here here again these are the ones we use, but in in Verilog we have zero and one, and then unknown and uninitialized are combined together as an X. And then high Z is still a Z. So the one we drop is this U. We don't have that type because they're combined together and represented with an X. Okay, so um, <clears throat> the signals are pretty much the same for both. Uh, the your 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 port list in both Verilog and VHDL has does have to indicate whether they're inputs, outputs, or whether they're bidirectional called in outs. And um, the internal signals within the body uh, of a module or within the architecture of a VHDL uh, module only have relevance within that architecture, within that module. They, they, they're, they just appear internally. They are not connected in any way to the outside world. Just like uh, a variable de declared in a, in a function only has scope within that function in C. All right, and then in uh, in VHDL, we have these operators and the binary ones, and, or, nan, nor, exclusive, or, exclusive, nor. And then we have these relational ones, shifts, addition, uh, concatenation, I think. Uh, and then we have the unary plus minus, multiply, divide, modulo, and remainder. And then uh, uh, not absolute value and uh, power. Uh, so these are VHDL. In Verilog, uh, we have we use the same symbols in C. So and is an ampersand, or is a vertical bar, and we don't we don't really have per se nan nor exclusive or is a caret is an up uh, is a up caret. Um, so it's a little different. We don't define math on bit vectors except really for addition. It's kind of defined automatically in that regard, but. Multiplication division not defined on bit vectors. Um, I'm not going to talk about the delta delay. It's just part of the simulation world. Uh, and uh, in in VHDL, you do want to use these these standard logic values because uh, because the uh, the 
the the simulator does do some uh, good testing on those. Whereas if you don't if you don't declare them as standard logic, then they don't do it. So you really should use the provided libraries. And um, all right. So remember, concurrent statements is they're just combinational logic statements. Whenever the right side changes, they execute. All right. Uh, I'm not. We've done this. Uh, okay. So sequential world. When you do sequential designs in VHDL, you use a process block. The process block uh, appears within the architecture within a mod within a module, essentially. And uh, and you use the keyword process, and then you have uh, a set of parentheses, and inside the parentheses you have the sensitivity list. And the process block only executes when one of the variables in the sensitivity list changes. We'll see this in a minute. And then you have the word begin, and then you have a bunch of statements, which the statements themselves look like simple combinational statements, and then you have an end. So the statements in the process block uh, uh, only execute when one of the one of the one of the signals in the sensitivity list changes, essentially. All right. So a, a D flip flop is a perfect example. So let's let's look at that. So here you have a VHDL model of a simple flip flop. So you have the, the keyword process, you have the signal, the sensitivity list here, and you have the signal in there, which is CLK for clock. Then you have the keyword begin, and then you have this if statement. Now this first business here, if clock tick event and clock equals one, this is this is kind of an idiomatic phrase in, in VHDL. What I mean is it's like it's just like saying I'm stuffed like a turkey, uh, or uh, I was scared to death, things like that. Uh, those are idioms, kind of a funny expression. Uh, I don't know, maybe scared to death is not a good example, but anyway. So this clock tick event means that the clock just changed, and clock equals one means now it's one. So that really means rising edge. If you put clock tick event and clock equals zero, that would be a falling edge. And then in the and then you say if this is true, then Q is assigned the, the value of D, and then it's an end if. Now one of the things that's also true, it's true in VHDL and it's true in Verilog, is that a lot of our logic, fancy logic statements like ifs, uh, while, uh, switch statements, things like that, they're only legal inside process blocks in the case of VHDL, or in the case of Verilog always blocks. So you can't use those outside of the sequential design blocks, uh, which is kind of interesting. All right, well anyway, so if we wanted to show a, a degated latch, uh, that's where when the gates open, uh, the input will change the output. Uh, when the when G is, uh, is it not active, then you, the input can change, but it doesn't propagate to the output. And when G is low, it, the latch just holds whatever the last value was when, when G went from active to inactive. Now, whether G is active, low, or active, high depends on, on how you write it in the, in the block. So in this case, you have a process block, so that means it's sequential logic. You have two signals, G and D, and then within that, Okay. Well, anyway, um, so anyway, if that if that happens, then uh, uh, well, so in this case, you have this if statement: if G equals one, then Q is assigned the results of D. All right. So whenever G is one, then uh, then changes in D will propagate. Now the process block executes whenever G or D changes. So that's why D has to be in this list. Because uh, if G is one, then you want this to execute when D changes because you're going to update Q. But if G is zero, then this if statement won't execute. So even even though it would execute, nothing would happen to D. Uh, to Q, sorry, the output Q. D could change, but Q wouldn't if G is zero. So this is a case where the gate is active high, and it's inactive low. So it's asserted only when G is one. So note that this executes whenever D or G changes, but Q only changes if G is 1. Gate is active high. 
All right. Now, here's a D flip flop. Uh, and this, this has also in VHDL. And here you have a clear. The clear is an asynchronous input because it's in the, in the sensitivity list. So clock and clear. Now, again, since we have a clock here, we have this idiom. Okay, we have this idiom. Uh, if clear not equals zero, then Q equals zero. Else, if clock tick event and clock equals one, so that's a rising edge clock because it's clock tick event, clock equals one. Remember, falling would be clock tick event and clock equals zero. Then the first thing is tested is clear not is so is the clear not zero, so that would be an active low clear. If it is, set Q to zero. If this is not true, then else if if clock tick event clock equals one. So did you have a rising edge? Well, if you did, then let Q equal D, and then if you didn't, you just don't do anything. So on a on a on a uh, in this case it's a falling edge, right? So if Sorry, it's a rising edge. If you had a falling edge, then nothing would happen. It, you could think of this as still executing, but nothing would happen. Now, in reality, the synthesizer makes a, a D flip flop with an active low clear. That's what it does in a rising edge clock. So, so that's what you get. You get that for hardware. All right. So, uh, so a process basically has. Uh, you have the keyword process, you have the sensitivity list, then you have the begin, the statements, and the end process. And the sensitivity list basically uh, uh, all the signals that will trigger the execution of the process block. Within the body of the process block, you can have you can have the you can have these if and conditional if if then if else and and other things. Okay. So here's a left shift register. You have the keyword clock. And then you have if clock tick event and clock equals one. So is it a rising edge or a falling edge? It is a rising edge because it equals one. If the clear is one, then uh, then you set Q equal to zero. In this case, Q is a four bit vector, apparently. So uh, and that would be defined up above here. Um, else, if load is one, then Q equals D. So D would be your your uh, would be your parallel load, and again a four-bit vector. Else, if uh, left shift is one, then Q shifts left to the one. And the way we do that, we redefine Q as Q two down to zero, and concatenated with the uh, with the input value. So we're going to shift in R n. We're going to shift uh, Q zero one two to the left so that now Q2 becomes Q3, Q1 becomes Q2, Q0 becomes Q1, and Rn becomes Q0. And that's what this statement does. And Q3 is discarded. All right, then end if, end if, end process. All right, uh, I'm not going to talk about the 7163 counter. I think I'm going to let that go. All right, so I think I'm going to finish with that. Um, and then we'll, uh, we'll, uh, we'll talk a little more. I will probably send out an email today uh, where I describe uh, uh, kind of how the how all due dates and the final and all that I'm going to lay all that out in an email I will send out to everybody today, um, and there'll be a little quiz for you to do after you finish the test. Uh, the quiz may not get posted for a little bit. I have another Zoom to do right now. Talk to you later.